So good evening. I'm Cheryl Ziegler, Director of Library and Archives, and on behalf of the ULCC Library Committee and Literary Subcommittee, welcome to our last program in the series on Black Entrepreneurship in Chicago, Past, Present, and Future. We appreciate your support of our programming and look forward to bringing you more on topics of interest in the future. So we're always interested in your ideas and interests, so please do not hesitate to contact me um, at librarian at ulcc.org. Um, I'd love to hear from you about your ideas and interests. Um, I would also like to encourage you to purchase books from Chicago's independent bookstores. The books for tonight's program can be found at semicolon bookstore and gallery. Um, I would also uh, like to give you a reminder that we really, really welcome your questions. So um, after the program, uh, we'll break and um, you can put your questions into the Q&A. Um, you can also put them into the Q&A during the program if you'd like. So I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers who will be talking about Black entrepreneurs in the advertising business. Dr. Jason P. Chambers is Associate Professor of Advertising at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign College of Media. Dr. Chambers has presented his research into the African-American consumer market, both nationally and internationally, and his published work includes Building the Black Metropolis, African-American Entrepreneurship in Chicago, which was co-edited with Dr. Robert Weems and Madison Avenue in the Color Line, African-Americans in the advertising industry. He has appeared on the History Channel discussing advertising issues and his opinions have been sought by a variety of periodicals, including Forbes and Black Enterprise magazines. In addition, he has consulted with national nonprofit organizations and Fortune 100 companies, as well as advertising agencies on matters of diversity, stereotyping, and various consumer issues. Dr. Chambers is a graduate of Bowling Green State University and the Ohio State University. Dr. Judy Foster Davis is a professor of marketing and integrated marketing, marketing communications marketing at Eastern Michigan University. Her research focuses on marketing communication strategies and policies in corporate and entrepreneurial settings historical and multicultural marketing topics. Dr. Davis has published in numerous journals and has been featured in the New York Times, American Black Journal, the Hartman Center at Duke University and the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. Her first book, Pioneering African-American Women in the Advertising Business, Biographies of Mad Black Women was published in 2017. Dr. Davis is a graduate of Howard University and Michigan State University. And I wanna welcome you both. Um, I'm thrilled to have you here and I'm really looking forward to this program. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. You notice I didn't say that I graduated from the Howard University. <laughs> There's a well, lot the of Howard talk these days. Oh, absolutely. I saw that uh, Howard just got a million dollars that they are going to use to start a global leadership piece. So, this, this so is great. my daughter is a senior at Howard and we're excited that uh, I have some hopes for the commencement. I, I don't want to speak on it right now, but I have some high hopes for that. So I'm going to go and share my screen and we're going to uh, get started. And we have an interesting discussion for you. And we decided that what we wanted to do was to highlight um, some of the people as well as the advertisements that relate to the black advertising community in Chicago. But before we get to that, um, I wanted to ask a question and I'm gonna let uh, Jason respond to this. And that is sometimes Chicago is referred to as the black metropolis. Mm -hmm. What made Chicago unique in terms of cultivating the early black business professionals, 
not just in advertising, because we're going to focus on them in just a few minutes, but what made Chicago unique? Well, I think, I think a couple of things made Chicago unique. One is geography, right? The geography of segregation. Segregation has a host of, of, of negative connotations. Of course, we recognize that. But within that negativity, you know, Blacks successfully were able to build community. They were able to take the restrictions that were put on them in, in terms of being restricted to areas on the south side or being restricted to areas on the west side. And within those restrictions, be able to build community and the institutions and the businesses and the organizations, the churches, the fraternal orders, the the businesses, the funeral parlors, all of the things that can go into and were uh, into a community, they were able to build. Now, were they were they totally insulated as though they were vacuum sealed in these areas on the south and west side? No, of course not. They were cross fertilization uh, from from outside the community as well as into the community. But that geographic restriction, that contiguous nature of the African American settlements in the in those two specific areas of the city, particularly on the south side, what that enabled African Americans to do was to build self to build businesses, but also businesses that were self supporting, right, there was a cross fertilization of, of one business to another, a, a grocery store owner that brought his, bought, you know, bought some of his goods from an African American supplier, or at a minimum strove to to hire African American employees. And so that sense of that sense of community support that came from um, and was fueled by the entrepreneurial uh, aspects of the African American community really helped to make Chicago very unique, um, especially in comparison to other cities, uh, New York being the, the preeminent one, um, and the tradition of African American business ownership, particularly in the 20th century, was greater here than it was in any other city, certainly in comparison to someplace like um, New York, which is often hailed as, as being the preeminent center of African American life and history. But when it comes to African American business in the 20th century, Chicago Chicago is that is that home. Okay, and you mentioned New York City, which is an important reference because when we think about the epicenter of the advertising business, we think about Madison Avenue. And in fact, mm -hmm. that is a part of the title of your book. But when we talk about the black advertising community, well, then we have to think about Michigan Avenue. So right. can you talk about that phenomenon and, and can we start to look at some of the key players who were part of this black dynamic advertising community in Chicago? Sure. Well, one of the things that, that certainly that fuels advertising is media, right? Is the ability to have a place for advertisements to go. If there's no place for an advertisement to go, then it then it exists off by itself. It exists in a vacuum. I don't I don't have a billboard for it to go up onto. I don't have a newspaper for it to go into. I don't have a television station or program to put it on. Then it, it, it really can't exist. Um, I guess we could put a flyer on the street, so to speak, but that would be of a very limited nature. And so when we think about it from that perspective, perspective, Chicago was the home of the of the major African American media organizations on, and periodicals for most of the 20th century, that being the, the Johnson publications, primarily Ebony and Jet Magazine based here in Chicago, the Chicago Defender as the African American, the, you know, the major national African American newspaper based obviously here in Chicago. And so those two periodicals as being areas of placement for advertisement gives it that flavor. And as the opportunity from other African-American owned businesses, for example, comes up as well as some other businesses that are interested in reaching the African-American consumer market, they begin to look to or begin, begin to be tapped into by African-American advertising organizations that are based here in Chicago. Vince Cullors and Barbara Proctor and Tom Burrell and, and others that, that we'll get to this evening. You, so that combination of uh, client side entities that wanna reach the African-American consumer market, some of which are based here in Chicago, uh, organizations like McDonald's, uh, periodicals like Ebony and Jet and Chicago Defender. And then you have African-American uh, advertising organizations or African-American advertising agencies and that opens the door um, for African Americans to, to really uh, foster growth in and, in and within the advertising industry as agency owners primarily. Right. Well, let's talk about then some of these pioneers and you mentioned a few of their names. Um, can you talk about, for example, uh, Vince Colors? 
Sure. Now, Vince Cullors had been a, he was a Marine combat artist. And so he fought in World War II in the, in the Pacific. And when he comes back to the United States, he wants to, you know, utilize his artistic talents, his, his artistic skills to get into the advertising business. And he's just not able to find that opportunity. He's just not able to find opportunity at uh, primarily white advertising organizations. <laughs> when, we say, when we say advertising agencies, we don't have to say white and black. In the 1950s, there were, there were, there were white agencies and very, very few, precious few, if any, African-American-owned ones, particularly in Chicago. And so he gets the opportunity. He works for a period of time at Johnson Publications, which is the, you know, the major African-American business in the city, of course, but also the leading African-American periodical uh, in the nation. And so he gets the opportunity to uh, apply his, uh, his artistic talents at Ebony for a period of time as an artist, as an art director. And then he will move into running and owning his own advertising agency. He made several efforts. I shouldn't say he didn't. He made several efforts to, to, to showcase his, his advertising art and his artistic skill to gain jobs at other advertising agencies, white owned advertising agencies. But he just found himself turned down again and again and again and again, he he would often relate the story of, you know, he would he would be invited for an interview based on his work, right? Which he would submit obviously without a picture of himself, of course. Um, and there's no, no internet back then for people to search you out on LinkedIn, so to speak. Um, and so he, he, he would submit his work, he would submit his, his, his artistic chops, if you will, to these agencies, and then he would show up and uh, all of a sudden, well, there's, there, there, there are no jobs here now anymore, at least not for people who look like you, is what he found. And so he then takes that and he, you know, he takes that continued disappointment and he, he, he channels it into starting his own advertising agency, uh, creating advertising for cigarette organizations, doing some local community advertising organizations, you know, gaining and getting enough business to keep the doors open and to hire uh, a, a few employees um, here and there over the years until his business actually takes off primarily in the, 19, in the 1960s and beyond. Right, okay. Well then let's talk about a couple of others, um, in particular, uh, Emmett McBain who partnered mm. with Tom Burrell, who you're gonna speak about next. But what's Emmett McBain's background and his contributions in this whole area? Well, Emmett McBain, well, he's, he's another artist. And, and again, we have to think like artists, um, you know, people who want to make a living utilizing the, 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 the skill that they have, right? Vince Colors was an artist. Emmett McBain was an artist. He was a graphic artist. He painted, you know, he, he drew. Um, he designed album covers. The image that you see here now uh, is a picture of him holding an album cover he designed for the uh, uh, one of the Playboy uh, magazine jazz album series. And so Emmett McBain actually, and, and Colors and McBain, both from Chicago, Emmett McBain actually worked for a period of time with, with Vince Colors early on in, in, in Colors agency's history. He's one of the first employees, if not the first, uh, beyond Colors' wife. Um, and so Emmett McBain was an artist and he went from places like Colors Agency, he was able to do some work for mainstream agencies, largely on a freelance basis uh, through the 1960s, um, from the 1950s through the 1960s and, and beyond. But he was another artist who wanted to use his talents as an artist to earn a living through advertising in the times in which he wasn't able to earn a living just based upon selling, um, selling his art. And so for an artist, advertising was a natural avenue if you didn't, you know, if you didn't have challenges with the consumerist, consumerist aspects of it. Advertising was an avenue for an artist to, again, make a living selling, you know, selling advertising work as well as continue to, you know, to, to, to grow their own talents. And so uh, McBain will work with colors, then he'll, again, he'll freelance for a period of time. Um, he runs for a very brief period of time as kind of his own freelance um, business until he will ultimately partner with Tom Burrell um, in the early 1970s to form the Burrell McBain agency. So again, you can kind of see that, that cross fertilization. He first works with colors and then he'll go then he'll freelance for a period of time and then he'll he'll start his own agency along with with fellow Chicago and Tom Burrell so you can kind of see that interweaving um, of that Chicago story that's part of that Chicago network 
uh, that we talk about in building the black metropolis is just that sense of, you know, not working for somebody else, but insofar as possible to work for yourself, to support the efforts from one agency to another or from one business to another. Yes, we are competitors at some, you know, at, at, at some points, but we're also, we're also cooperative um, in building this African-American entrepreneurial community. Um, and that's a, a, a theme of Chicago's African-American business history is that sense of, yes, we do, you know, we do compete, but we also, in some cases, but we also cooperate in helping to support this, the Chicago African-American um, business community. Okay. So you mentioned Tom Burrell and mm -hmm. they were business partners. Mm -hmm. And Tom Burrell is a member of the AF Hall of Fame, which is, it's, it's kind of like being, um, it's kind of like receiving an, an Academy Award in the advertising community. Um, and there are a small number of, of African-Americans who have received that recognition. So what's Tom Burrell's story? And I know you're writing a whole book on Tom Burrell. So we're gonna keep it um, a, a little bit condensed, but Tom Burrell is legendary in the black advertising community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like like Colors, like McBain, he's another another Chicagoan who looked to advertising as a way to become a professional. He he over the years he's he told the story many times and and in, of how he first encounters advertising in high school, right? Vis a vis a a a, a test. Um, on career aptitudes, if you will. And the results of his test led for his teacher in the 1950s, which is wonderfully unique, um, which led for his teacher seeing the results of his test, this aptitude in persuasiveness, this aptitude in writing, uh, when he went and he asked her what, what these, these things meant, um, she said, well, it means that you would be a good, could be a, a good advertising copywriter. And he didn't know what that was. and. You know, again, it's the 1950s. If we said that today, if we asked 10 people today what an advertising copywriter was, most of them would have to go to Google or Wikipedia to figure out what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because you don't know, because we, we see advertising, we see it all the time. Um, but when we actually, you know, dig into the creation of it, who, who wrote the words or who come up, came up with the images, most people can't explain that understandably. And so when Burrell gets that, that, that nod in the 1950s that he could be a, an advertising copywriter, he latches onto that and he makes that his, his professional pursuit. Right, and so he will he will go to college to and he will major in advertising until he gets his first opportunity as a as a junior in college to work for um, Wade Advertising, which at the time was the third largest advertising agency in the in the city of Chicago. Um, and with through Wade Advertising, they hire him to work in the mailroom, and he matriculates from the mailroom at Wade um, through the Leo Burnett Agency, which is also in Chicago. He will then spend time overseas. Uh, a little bit less than a year, spending time overseas in France and in England, also working in advertising there, comes back to work for Needham, Harper and Steers for a period of time. And then in 1971, he and Emmett McBain will take advantage of the, the opportunity that's growing in the country, the attention that's growing in the late 1960s, early 1970s to this African-American consumer market. And so what Burrell's idea was and what made Burrell McBain different is McBain had a history of advertising work. So he was experienced in advertising and Burrell had at that point, nearly a decade's worth of experience in the advertising business, matriculating through its various levels at multiple agencies. And what made them different in 1971 versus other people who were African-Americans who were starting advertising agencies is that they were advertising professionals who had experience in advertising, who are now going to start an advertising agency. There were other people who were, maybe had some tangential experience in advertising, maybe in advertising sales, maybe they had done something on the, on the client side, maybe they had worked for a, an advertiser like a, a, a Procter & Gamble or something along those lines, and then they got into advertising, but they were kind of learning it on the job or learning it as owners. Burrell and McBain already had that experience and they brought that to advertising. And with that came that purpose to develop advertising that really emphasized and sold 
African-American culture. Others had sold, and this is something I talk about in the book, other African-American agencies had sold their expertise on reaching black people and selling, and, and, and selling potential clients on their expertise at getting access and, and, and insight and knowledge about black people. Burrell and McBain had that, but they also married that to a sense of delivering upon a vision of African-American culture right, African-American life, the, 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 the heretofore hidden aspects to the majority population, the heretofore hidden aspects of African-American life and culture that weren't seen in the programs, that certainly weren't seen in the advertising, Burrell and McBain, and then later Burrell, because uh, McBain leaves after about three and a half to four years, they bring those elements of African-American life and culture into advertising for clients like Coca-Cola and McDonald's and later Toyota and Ford and a whole host of others. And that is that, that what Burrell speaks on in later years and McBain helped to set the foundation of and then Burrell really expands on it is this concept of positive realism, right? Positive realism, take the, take the positive aspects of African-American life, the positive aspects of African-American culture, whatever it is we're talking about. Okay. And, deli and deliver those in a realistic way in advertising to help sell the client's products, McDonald's, Coca-Cola and others, Crest and uh, Jack Daniels and Marlboro and a host of others um, that, that, that he would do so very effectively um, for the better part of, of three decades. Okay. And so, and we're going to look at some examples coming up, uh, coming up shortly. Um, I do want to touch on um, a couple of the women who were important to this story of, of advertising in Chicago. And one is Barbara Gardner Proctor, who was the first African-American woman to start an advertising agency in the United States. And she was in, she started her company right in that time when there's what we sometimes refer to as this, this golden age. In 1970 in Chicago, she opened her firm but she had worked in other mainstream, which basically was a code word for, for white agencies where she had uh, developed managerial skills, um, had developed advertising talent because she didn't come into advertising as a young woman. Uh, she had had experience as a record company executive and some others in part of that, uh, that, that black entrepreneurial uh, community that you talked about in the Black metropolis, there was a record company called VJ Records, which I think was the equivalent of Motown. It was the Motown of, of Chicago. And I'm a Detroit girl, so you know Motown is a, is a big deal here. Um, oh, yeah. So, yes. So she actually had been their international director, and she was flying back and forth to Europe on a regular basis to bring artists over to the United States in what they called an artist swap. And mm -hmm. a little known fact is that Barbara Gardner Proctor actually introduced the Beatles to the American culture. She's never gotten credit for that, but their first album was cut at VJ Records. Mm -hmm. And that's a little known black history fact. But moving forward to her, her advertising career, she called her agency Proctor and Gardner. And she did that because she was combining her last name and her married name because she was, she was divorced by the time she got her firm off the ground. But dealing with not only the issues that you have alluded to in terms of the difficulty of, of African-Americans getting into the advertising business. But now she's a woman on top of it. And so she had to deal with the, the racism and the sexism. And she wanted to create this illusion that there was a, a male partner someplace in the background handling the business and that she was kind of just a front woman. And so she launched her company. She was very successful. At one point, she was cited by President Reagan in 1984 during his State of the Union address as an example of the spirit of enterprise. And I actually remember watching that program 
I was much younger and I was fascinated. I said, well, who is this woman? And that same year she was featured on 60 Minutes and she was being chauffeured in this limousine through the streets of Chicago and she had this company and she just seemed to have so much going on. And I will admit that she inspired me in terms of what, you know, a black woman could accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share some examples of her work and we're going to look at some uh, commercials as well. Um, I do want to talk about one other extremely successful woman in this business. And this is Carol H. Williams, who is a native of Chicago and was a student at Northwestern when she interned at the Leo Burnett Agency, which is one of the preeminent agencies in the world and was like the epicenter of the Chicago advertising community. And in her role, she was able to achieve heights that had not been seen before for, you know, for a black person and a woman um, when she was elevated to the vice presidency of uh, the creative department at Leo Burnett. Eventually she went on and established her own company. She established it in California because she had gone out there to take another job, uh, an executive job with a uh, foot cone building. And she eventually left that company, got married, decided to get back into the advertising business some a few years later and started her own company in Oakland, California. But she mm -hmm. then opened another office in I think it's 2004 in her hometown of Chicago. And mm -hmm. Carol is still in business today she is the Hall of Fame recipient for 2017, the first African-American creative woman ever to achieve that, that accolade. So we see some very dynamic people that have just come out of Chicago and have really made a difference in the Chicago advertising community. So I think people wanna see some, some advertisements and some sure because one of the reasons why I think it's so important to talk about the people behind the ads, and I call these people the image makers, is because we'll see these ads and commercials and we have no idea who is behind the work. And so I think it's important that we talk about um, who they are, uh, because I know that the viewers of this webinar are going to recognize some of these and had no idea who the people were behind these ads. So as we shift into this portion of the discussion, um, let's look at some examples and talk about the contributions and the reflections of African-American and black culture that came out of this work. So I think we have a few examples from the Vince Colors Agency. Black is sure. Beautiful, 1968. I remember sure, and I, I was really young, but I remember those times. Well, I, I always I always loved this poster. This was a poster that it was, it's obviously advertising the, the, the Colors Advertising Agency and, and their services. It was done by Colors and McBain um, working in combination, but listing out all of these negatives, black ball, black book, black boy, black guy, on and on and on, this, 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 this summation of negativity, if you will. And then at the bottom, you know, the, the result is not the sum that you think it is. He, he and they put it forth as, 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 as white lies with the true result being black is beautiful. And it points up the, the purposed nature of the African-American advertising agency, the purposed nature of African-American creatives in particular, particularly those particularly those coming out of Chicago, people like Colors and McBain and Pharrell and others who used advertising, not just to sell products, but utilized advertising to push forth other ideas that utilized advertising to present an, 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 an image, an alternative image of, uh, of, of African-American life, to turn ideas on their head like, like Colors and McBain did in this poster here. It, it is the continuation of a stream in African-American art and culture, right? Langston Hughes talked about it a bit in his 
uh, essay, The Negro Artist and Racial Mountain, when he talks about and he says, we know, you know, Black people know they're beautiful and ugly too. We can be the range of things. The challenge with African, excuse me, the challenge with, with, with mainstream media, the challenge with, with most of the, the image representations of African Americans throughout history and even up to and through our own time is that too many often of them, too often many of them rather are these negative, are, are, you know, exhibit this negativity, these lies and this stereotypes, these stereotypes. And so artists and agency owners like Colors, you know, look to use advertising and in, in their own artistic way as part of their contribution against some of those ideas as we see here in this poster um, for the Colors Agency. Well, there's other work by Colors. And when you talk about Black is Beautiful, uh, the Afro Sheen ads, were so instrumental in presenting that black is beautiful aspect and mm -hmm. with the natural hair. And I, I think it's interesting now that we have a natural hair movement in, uh, in this country, in this era. So speak to the meaning behind these executions. Well, you know, it's, it can sometimes be challenging, especially if you if you weren't alive in this era, it, it, it can sometimes be challenging to 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 remember to recall, or at least to recognize how often the negativity associated with being black was hammered again and again and again and again, and so many different elements in nearly every element of, of popular culture that you can think of music and movies and TV and literature and art and oh, every area that you can think of, games. Mm -hmm. It's hammered home be, that being black is anything but being beautiful. Mm -hmm. Being black is anything but being attractive. And so to push back against decades, if not centuries of that negativity has an impact. Yes, it's for selling. The, the, the main purpose of this ad is to sell Afro Sheen, a product of another Chicago company. Um, the main product uh, communication here is to sell Afro Sheen, but it's also to push forth that idea that's out there in the, in the black power and the black cultural arts movements of the time that are talking about, that are taking this thing that is, has, has been has nearly brainwashed a people, right? The thing that African-American artists had been pushing against, again, Hughes and others for years and decades to take that and incorporate that idea into an advertisement, right? Black isn't yeah. negative. Black isn't dirty. Black isn't reprehensible. Black isn't just all of this stuff that, 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 that's weighing down on your shoulders that, that our culture has told you that it is, no. Black is beautiful. And he makes a linkage here between, if you read in the lower uh, right-hand corner, he makes a linkage between African-Americans in Africa with his use of, uh, of, of, of the, the language of Swahili. Swahili, exactly. So, so he's I, making, making that linkage. Right, and he also does that in another execution that's, that's not here, but he has some, in, it, the, where the entire ad is in, in Swahili is translated, of course. And mm -hmm. I remember those ads and it was just like, wow, just like here for this Newport mm -hmm. ad. Um, he's wearing, a, uh, he has the model wearing the daishiki. And mm -hmm. I mean, this was just really bold and just like, wow, at that point in time, because you didn't see that. You didn't see that in advertising. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing. You did not see it. Right, and so for to, to to have it in an ad is arresting. And yes, it's for cigarettes. And yes, there is the push pull. Yes, there is the tension of the you know what the art and the image and the communication is, along with that of what what the the advertisement is for. And so yes, there is that push pull. There is that tension that Colors and McBain and Burrell and others recognized. And each one of them would have to come to their own. Um, set of standards on what products they, types of products they would and would not work for, cigarettes or alcohol or fast food, what have you. So each right. one of them would have to come to that understanding 
And it would be a little bit different for each of them. But within that, if they decided to advertise or work on the advertising for a company like Newport, how they tie in elements, at least the visual representations of to, 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 to normalize this idea, this positivity of, you know, the Afro or the dashiki or African art or African style clothing, what have you, to bring that into the, the advertisement uh, in terms of also helping to normalize it within the community. Right. Absolutely. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit because the Burrell agency executions have an entirely different kind of, of style and look. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. And you, and you use the terminology positive realism. How does that tie into these executions? Well, let's take a look at what we have here on the, on the left side here for Coca-Cola for the real times. What have you got here? You've got, a, pr presumably, uh, a grandmother and the grandchild, and what are they doing? They're enjoying a moment. They're snapping beans together. Now, I snap, snap many a bean over, the, over, my, over my young years. It wasn't always fun. It wasn't always enjoyable. But as a, as a moment, right, as a moment, it speaks to African-American family. Right, uh, excuse me for one second. Uh, it speaks to African-American family. And again, looking back from 2020, almost 2021, well, why would, why would that be a big deal? Because it wasn't shown, exactly. it wasn't seen. Now we're, we're post eight years of Barack Obama. We've had African-Americans play presidents and doctors and leaders and all kinds of things on television. We've got to put our minds back to the point in which we were absent. If you weren't looking at an ebony or a jet or an essence or a black enterprise, you and you were black, you were absent. You weren't in TV, right? You weren't in magazines. You weren't in newspapers, unless it was to tell you about some crime that had been committed, some, you know, yeah. some poor unfortunate African American had probably been murdered by the police. But people didn't think about black love. Right? They didn't think about Black people going to school. They didn't think about Black family and kinship ties. And so putting that reminder, that vision, that image in the advertisement makes it stand out. It is that positive realism that African-Americans do have those things. Or the image that you see here on the right for Crest, a Black man and his son, a Black father and his child. It's a 180 degree turn from all of that negativity here. This crest status from 1984 about, you know, absent fathers and deadbeat dads and X percentage of black men, you know, they don't, they don't stay in the home. Well, 30, 35 percent of black men don't don't stay in home or whatever ridiculous percentage it was. Well, that means that 65 percent of them do. Right. So that means the overwhelming majority of them do. But the only thing that mainstream media wants to talk about is those that don't as a way to once again continue to propagate this negativity about the African-American community. Well, Burrell takes that and says no. And he often talks about this ad because some of these ads were somewhat biographical for him as a father um, with his, you know, with his own son. Right. And speaking about the positive relationship between black men and black fathers and their children, sons, and sons and daughters. And that's what these advertisements speak to. It's the, the image of not only what is, and he would speak about this later, it's the image of not only what is, what, what exists in the African-American community, grand, grandparents and grandchildren, fathers and sons, but also what can exist, right? Because advertising is aspirational. You know, all advertising, unless you're talking about the competition, is positive about the, the product in question. And so he, he, he lends that positivity for, on behalf of Crest, through the relationship of, of Black fathers and children, and for Coca-Cola, through Black, black grandparents and, and grandchildren. Right. Okay. I didn't even know about this one, Jason. I had no idea. I, I, I missed this. So this <laughs> 1998 for, for Sprite, which is a, a Coke product. And it's, it's interesting that the examples that we're showing also show the capability of these agencies to attract major accounts. Um, mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, you mentioned McDonald's and um, some of the ones that are coming up, Kraft and General Motors. So they had that wherewithal to be able to go and compete and, and develop messaging, you know, at that level. So mm -hmm. did you want to comment on this one at all? 
Yeah, man, I, I, I love this advertising series that, that Burrell did for Sprite, um, linking it with Japanese anime, linking it with, with hip hop. We call it, we call these artists old school now um, or classic hip hop. I mean, they were the leading artists of their time in the, in the late, 19, uh, late 1990s, artists like Fat Joe and Africa Bambata. Um, and common, a fellow, uh, you know, a Chicagoan, Mac Ten from the West Coast, and so what they were able to do at that time, and and you know, some of our viewers may be asking themselves, well, how is this positive realism? Well, one of the things that you have to remember about hip hop from that particular time period was its specific association with violence, right? You know, if 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 hip hop or rap music, I use them use the terms interchangeably, even though they're not, they don't exactly mean the same thing. Um, if you read an article in the newspaper or magazine about hip hop or rap music, it was usually in some ways negative, right? Some violence that appeared at a concert or some movie was put out, you know, kids who got in a fight at the, at the movie theater, whatever the case may be. But what Burrell was able to do for Coca-Cola through, uh, through the vehicle of Sprite was talk about the more positive aspects of, of the music and of the genre and what some of the artists were trying to do. And this particular series was about hip hop artists from various areas of the country, from the South, from the Midwest, from the East Coast, from the West Coast, them coming together in the same way that the Voltron, for those who know the, the cartoon, in the same way that the Voltron, the, the five separate elements of the Voltron robot came together to form the singular robot itself, that was Voltron, the artists came together in a similar way. And so they did this wonderful multi-part advertising series that was print, that was, that was outdoor, that was radio, that was primarily TV, that, that, that melded these ideas together that said hip hop is more than violence and Sprite is a part of that. That is so cool. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful series. Oh, you got some, you got some, uh, some Barbara Proctor work here, I see. Proctor and Gardner advertising. Um, mm. Some of her work, in, in my opinion, is in that vein of the positive realism. However, mm. her work was extremely family oriented. And there are two examples here. One is Jewel Food Stores, which was the, the grocery store that's based in Chicago, Chicago and it's, it's owned by Albertsons now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, like you mentioned, you didn't see advertising featuring black people in just, you know, normal settings. Mm -hmm. if, looking at Jewel Foods, you see what appears to be a working mother. She has on a suit. She's dressed as if she has I guess gone to work and maybe gone to the supermarket on the way home. You see two children coming in from outside the house. And I don't know if you can make it out, but there's on that chalkboard, it said game today. And you see a, a boy coming in with, with a basketball. And mm -hmm. it just seems so ordinary and so normal, but that was just such a celebration of black life and black culture. And what she was successful in doing was convincing the black consumer market that the Jewel Food Store was a help meet and helping mm -hmm. this working mother meet the needs of her family. Now, some people might argue, well, where is, you know, where's the dad? We don't know if there's a dad or he's just not there. And that's right. somewhat irrelevant because what happens in the black community is that we do have a lot of single mothers, which is fine. We have an awful lot of working mothers. In fact, the working mother is more of a norm in the black community than in some other communities. And so this just reflects that. And mm -hmm. if you read the tagline, this was used consistently throughout the advertising for Jewel Foods, which, which was her longest standing client, people helping people make it. So again, that idea of helpfulness and the help me that aspect. This other ad on this page features Kraft cheese. And what this is, is about love and family and nurturing. And the way that the girl is positioned with the black doll, again, it looks so just ordinary. But this is just very astounding for that period because 
if you saw black children render in ads in previous eras, they were neglected and dirty and uh, pictured as pickaninnies and just all kinds of pejorative things. And this is really an ad that focuses on uh, home life and home care because this is not macaroni and cheese out of the box with the dry powder that you mix up with water or what have you. This was homemade macaroni and cheese casserole, a comfort food that is provided presumably on a work day. Caring is an everyday thing. So this wasn't a special occasion. This was an everyday normal thing. And it again spoke to the nurturing and the home life that was very wholesome. And it kind of, to me, harkens to that ad for Crest that shows the father and son and the son is teaching, um, I'm sorry, the father's teaching the son how to tie the tie. Uh, again, it goes back to the love and the family and the wholesomeness. And this was a hallmark of Barbara uh, Proctor's work because she wouldn't do uh, tobacco advertising. She wouldn't do hard alcohol. She, she didn't do anything that she thought was uh, detrimental to either the black community or women. And I think that these two examples kind of exemplify her, um, her approach uh, to advertising. Um, a couple of other examples come out of uh, Carol H. Williams. The one on the left is for Secret Antiperspirant, which is a Procter & Gamble brand. And I will point out that this work didn't come out of the Carol H. Williams agency. Uh, this work came out of Leo Burnett when she worked there in the creative department. And her assignment was to take a dog brand, which in marketing is a, a, a brand that is almost dead in the water. And she took that brand and she came up with this, with this slogan that is strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. And she had a series of executions that featured black models as we see here, but also white models. Mm -hmm. And within six months, the secret antiperspirant brand shot to number one in that category. That sealed her reputation as a problem solver. And by targeting black women and white women specifically, she was able to capitalize on the needs in the marketplace in such a way that was realistic. Women were working, but women also wanted to be excellent in their persons and they wanted to be feminine and they wanted to be fresh. So it tapped into that and that brand took off like a rocket. Mm -hmm. Another example, and this is the General Motors ad that's featuring Muhammad Ali, which is, which is notable because Muhammad Ali was not one to attach his name to too many commercial uh, uh, pro projects. That was not what he was about. Um, another thing that is pretty phenomenal is that women's professional lives and agencies were, were often constrained by product types. So men worked on men's accounts and women worked on women's accounts. So it was a big deal for a woman to work on an automotive account. This came out of the Carol H. Williams Agency, which she founded in uh, 1986 and has been a successful agency ever since to this day. And what we see here is General Motors was one of the, you know, Procter & Gamble and General Motors kind of jockeyed for the number one and two spots in terms of advertising spending. Um, over the years, if you look at leading national advertiser data, for example, and to be able to land an account of that caliber and to do the type of work for General Motors, which remains a Carol H. Williams uh, client to this day, uh, is just phenomenal when you consider all of the kinds of prejudices against women in advertising and African-Americans and this whole thing, when you think about 
how does somebody like that, you know, end up in this kind of a position? And she just really is uh, brilliant and is a problem solver in such a way that she enjoys this work and it just flows and it illustrates itself in, in the outcomes. So um, I wanted to make sure that we got to that. And, right. and there might be a couple of other commercials that we wanted to show. I yeah, we're, we're getting kind of to the end of our time. The I want to leave a, a little okay. bit of time for, um, for questions. However, Dr. Chambers, did you want to show the, the video? Uh, sure, let's see here if I can. Uh, Judy, you have to stop sharing yep. sharing your screen. Stopping my share. Okay. And I will show one since we are we are low on time. Um, before you start, um, let me just remind folks that um, if you have questions, please put it in the, the Q&A, please. Okay, so the commercial that I'm going to show is from the 1980s for Coca-Cola. It's a commercial that Burrell did featuring the Grambling, featuring the Grambling State University marching band. Uh, Grambling being a historically black college university based in Louisiana. And again, the it, it brings the unique visual and performance style of African-American uh, bands, college bands, something that most white consumers had never seen. It brings that into the living rooms of, of America. So let's hope I can make this work. <laughs> So it, it brings something that African-Americans were long since familiar with. You know, Dr. Davis, you know this from having gone to, to, to HU, right? You know all yeah. about that. But, but to, the, to the mainstream consumer, and maybe even some African-Americans who didn't go to an HBCU, this is a unique image. It's a unique picture. It's a unique performance that, that they had never seen before. And it's linked together with, with Coca-Cola. And so through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, especially, if you were talking about seeing, you know, most of the images that you saw of African-Americans in advertising, TV and print especially, were in some way linked either to an agency in Chicago or somebody like Carol Williams who had kind of cut their teeth on advertising uh, in the city of Chicago as well. So Chicago is very much a player, very, very influential um, in the in the African-American advertising community well into the, the early 21st century. Yep. So, okay. Um, if you have questions, please put Put it in the chat, or I'm sorry, not the chat, not the chat, um, in the, the, the Q&A. Um, I, I had a question. Um, when you were talking about, when you were talking about the ads and, um, you know, the, the positive realism, were, where were these ads placed? Were they, were they placed um, primarily in, in the, you um, African American publications, or were they, I mean, were they targeted at all, or were they across the board? Ex excellent question. What makes Burrell unique amongst any advertising agency well through the 20th century is that, that their work was on television, right? African Americans had seen positive representations of themselves, certainly in black newspapers, periodicals that were aimed at them as a consumer group. They had seen those things um, over the years. But Burrell put them on TV. And if you think about television in the 1980s and 90s, you're still very much talking about network television, 
right? You're, you're talking about programs that are aimed at broad audiences. There, there is no, for, for much of that latter part of the century, there's no BET to speak of. There's no targeted television networking to speak of. And so he's putting these images like what we just saw for Coca-Cola. He's putting them out there for African-American consumers, yes, but he's doing so in the presence of white consumers because they were all watching the same programs because we're, we all only have CBS, ABC, uh, and NBC, and later Fox, and later you know cable and satellite spreads across the country. But for much of that latter portion of the century, the placement is on programming that is aimed at a broad swath of audiences. If you're talking about print or outdoor or radio, then you're talking about a more specified distribution to African-American consumers, but on, on television, it's being delivered to the broad swath of America. I, I was curious about the, the, um, the poster. The, uh, where, do you, do you recall where that was, was placed? Was it placed in the, the advertising trade magazines or? Yes, that, that would be correct. Or it would be, for example, it might be a direct mailer uh, that, that, um, that, that, uh, that the colors agency sent out um, as well, because they were very direct. Colors was very direct about what type of agency it was he uh, that he wanted to be. He he would he said in a number of interviews, "We're a black agency. We're run by black people, and we 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 create advertising that's aimed, um, you know, that's aimed at black people." So he he didn't mince words in terms of what it is that he was trying to do as an agency owner. So he felt confident being you know being forthright in the way that we saw in the poster. Um, uh, that ended with the summation of black is beautiful. And I wanted to add on to uh, Jason's comments because when I worked in advertising, I worked on the media side. So we were placing ads in you know various, uh, various places. We didn't have, when I worked, we were not in the internet age yet. Um, so to have a company like Coca-Cola sponsor a commercial, you know, you also had to have the client willing to invest in paying the cost to have an ad on a network. Um, that was important because a lot of the ads that we have seen, you would have found in Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine. Uh, in, in fact, if you do archival work and if you're a, a historian like Jason and I are, um, I have a, a, a collection. Um, it's not as, ex as, as extensive as I would like it to be, but I have years, I have decades of Ebony magazines, which if you're doing our work and you want to get these ads and you want to be able to scan them because you can find things now that are online, but you can't get the resolution and things that you need to be able to you know, publish and do some other things with them. So um, a lot of the advertising was targeted and if you were, you know, black and grew up in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, you saw these in Ebony Magazine for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so like Jason mentioned, Johnson Publications was a big part of the outlet in terms of how these ads were distributed to the consuming public. We have just a, a couple more minutes. Um, could both of you or, or um one of you or uh, speak to you know where the where the advertising industry is now regarding um, black professionals uh, unfortunately in terms of percentages maybe in terms of raw numbers but in terms of percentages it's not much beyond where it was in the 1970s um, the percentage of, of African Americans who work in advertising just has not appreciably increased for a variety of reasons, even as we enter the, you know, the next, the next decades of the, of the 21st century. It continues, it's an age, excuse me, it's an industry rather that continues to struggle um, to attack, excuse me, attack, to attract and retain uh, African-American employees. It just, it just is. Right, it, it, it hasn't been a particularly hospitable industry for African-Americans. And like Jason said, I, I would argue that to some extent, the industry may have actually regressed. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that um, you have budgets for, uh, you know, ethnic markets and multicultural markets that, you know, follow demographic trends. And so when the 2000 census came about and it indicated that uh, the, the Hispanic market was, had eclipsed 
the African American market in terms of size, then a lot of these ethnic marketing dollars, you know, followed that market. Um, and you've seen some fallout in terms of the, the black media. Uh, some publications have gone by the wayside. Um, there's just pressure in general for print, you know, from the digital, you know, evolution. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult space for African-Americans and there are any number of initiatives to try to correct that. Um, but it, it's an admittedly uphill battle. Yes. Well, and I, I assume that both of you in your teaching positions are, are working toward that. Yeah, you know, again, it's, it's yeah. one of those things. It's, it's what um, Judy and I were referring to earlier, which is in a lot of ways, you know, advertising is a, is a visible yet hidden profession. We all see its work. We all see its output. You know, we, we all, you know, saw dozens or hundreds of ads today. So we see the output, but in terms of, you know, if you're 17, 18, 19 years old and thinking about what am I going to go to college for? Or what profession do I want to pursue? Um, thinking about, you know, the industry that produces so much of what we see, it's just a leap that most just don't make. Right. So it's visible, but invisible and, and it's kind of visible, but invisible at the at the same time. Um, and then you get into some of the nepotistic aspects of it. And it, it becomes a challenging um, business for people who aren't in certain communities to to, to really get into mm -hmm. and, and and to stay in, I should say, not just to get into, but also to to stay in, because a lot of people um, talk about, yeah, I got into advertising, but I, but I got out just as fast. Right. Um Dr. Davis, Dr. Chambers, um, I, I want to thank you for, for sharing your time with us this evening. Um, I'm really grateful. Um, and I want to thank everybody who joined us for this program. Um, please remember books can be uh, purchased through semicolon bookstore. And again, thank you. Um, have a good evening. And thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for the invitation. And thank you, Judy. Uh, I appreciated the conversation, Judy. So thank you as well. And thank you, Brian, for your IT support also. So thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Have a good evening. You thank too. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.